as ready as I'll be. Do I have to sit down? No. I'm going to stand here? Right? Okay. All right. Ta-da! <laughs> <clears throat> Hello, and thank you all <laughs> for uh, coming to this colloquium in our unusual location of the Nightingale Gallery. Not I mean, that not unusual. Unu unusual for the colloquium, not an unusual okay. location. It is my pleasure to introduce Mike Sell, uh, who will be talking about uh, No Photos, Please, his display on the walls around here. Uh, Mike was born in Detroit, and his photography has been exhibited throughout <laughs> Michigan and Oregon in select shows in Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, and cities in Europe. He is a member of the Society for Photographic Education and the Popular Cultural Association, and has presented his visual research at SPE Northwest conferences in Portland and Eugene, several popular cultural association national conferences, including Washington DC in 2021, and the International Conference of the Image in Zaragoza, Spain in 2023. In 2014, he was an invited speaker and exhibiting artist at Hubusapia Gallery in Tallinn, Estonia, for which he received a grant from the Oregon Arts Commission. And in 2022, he was an artist in residence at Proyecto ACE in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And he also presented in the inaugural Fish Studies Conference at Oregon State University in 2019. And he wants everybody to know that to date, he has seen fish in concert 20 times. <laughs> Take it away, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I was going to reach right in front of you as soon as you started talking. I was not conscious of what I was doing. And I'm going to leave that open. Although whenever I leave my water bottle open, I'm afraid I have this irrational fear that there might be an earthquake and that it'll tip and like get electrical equipment wet or whatever. Um, uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm uh, really excited to present this work in this format and to talk about it in this kind of uh, new way as I've investigated these sort of new concepts uh, that kind of grew out of culminating the work or compiling the work and putting it together for, for this exhibition specifically. Uh, before I get started, though, I want to thank Steve Tanner uh, and Jared Jolin. I know he's in here. There he is. Uh, as members of the colloquium committee for being gracious enough to allow us to move things in here. Uh, for A.D. Bjork, who presented colloquium in January, but was kind enough to swap the booked slots so that I didn't have to present colloquium while we were still literally installing the show. Uh, thanks to AV uh, for being accommodating and setting everything up, Devon, Gibb, and the rest of the crew. Thanks to uh, gallery director Corey Peake for the opportunity to exhibit this work uh, and fill this gigantic space and have a newfound understanding of what our seniors have to go through every single year. Uh, good luck, everybody. Uh, to uh, my colleagues, Nate and Susan, for being uh, great folks, and Corey for making the art department a great place to work. To Hadley, uh, who is our student gallery director this year and was a big help uh, answering my questions uh, very quickly uh, whenever I had concerns about everything from bringing work in the gallery, installing, hanging, and to Hadley and the crew of diligent workers, Sira, Angelin, Marin, and Shelby, uh, who learned how to divide fractions uh, and hang magnets and uh, get this work up on the wall and have it look uh, so fantastic and uh, save me some time in the process. Let's get started. Is that dark enough? I don't know if it's dark enough. Is it dark enough? Is it okay? Is it showing up on the video? Oh, you're streaming right to the thing. You're cheating. Okay. As I uh, started putting this talk together, at first I thought it best to present the, the story of my sabbatical in chronological order. But in the last few years, We've seen a technological shift away from reading information or seeing information in chronological ways as the norm shifts towards an emphasis on algorithms and hierarchies. When we pick up a phone and when we turn on uh, Facebook or Instagram or whatever uh, the kids are using these days, uh, we don't see the most important, or the, sorry, we don't see the most recent posts first and then scroll down to see uh, older posts following in the old, like we did in the old days. Instead, we now see the most important images first. And we've become, as viewers, beholden to the algorithm and the machines we carry with us in our daily lives. 
The same is true of a curated exhibition, such as this, because uh, I got to put stuff where I wanted to put stuff. Uh, and as such, my talk will utilize the same tactics. So settle in uh, and let me, the machine in front of you, tell you about the most important elements of my sabbatical in the order I choose, as there will be no questions following this presentation, and thank you for agreeing to the terms and conditions. <laughs> in April of 2023, uh, almost a year ago now, during a very unsabbatical related activity, I lost my balance, as some of you know, and fell off of a ladder in our backyard. The concrete patio and a set of small handmade steps broke my fall, and in the process broke five of my ribs. If my math is correct, and I don't know if I see any math professors, uh, uh, and my torso was about eight or eight and a half feet off the ground, then by my calculations, my entire fall took a little bit less than three quarters of a second. Lots of things changed for me, it might go without saying, between the time it took for me to fall, the time it took for my wife, Jessie, to come find me, laying on the ground, helpless, uh, the time before the ambulance arrived, actually they sent two, don't know why, uh, the time I spent in the hospital and the many weeks of recovery and sitting around that followed all of this. Now, 313 days later, as of today, it feels like this all happened ages ago, and many of these different perceptions of time live within the work that I've presented here in the exhibition. While I was laid up with broken ribs, I turned to the computer and my phone to make new work because there wasn't really much lugging around photography equipment. There wasn't really much lugging around anything. These aren't exhibited here, but the work was a collection of what I've called digital rugs, or these pattern designs uh, that I made using photos that I took while walking the dog or just sort of uh, putzing around the house. I made these on my uh, iPhone with a layout app where I could uh, turn and rotate and mirror images, and then as these uh, designs got more and more complex, they turned into these sort of very decorative um, designs like you see here. This work, though, dates back to 2017, uh, I started making these sort of rugs they, when they were more politically motivated using uh, Google search images of then President Donald Trump and his uh, cronies and other people who were holding higher office. These new rugs, though, reflected uh, the everyday nature of the world around me as I reemerged from injury and I was able to take the dog outside. I found that I could take the familiarity of the everyday and transform it into something new and a little bit the same at the same time. I was repeating myself. The repetitive nature of this work, both in its process, which was very process-oriented to make these designs, and in its final appearance, is reflective of an overarching theme within my photographic work. My artistic practice allows me to make work within the situations I find myself. The last time I participated here in our biennial uh, faculty exhibition in 2021, the work, uh, all of the work that I presented related to COVID, the pandemic, and quarantine time spent with my family. In my artist statement for that work, I addressed a compulsion to making the work in the gallery. It was, if, it was as if the work helped me to understand the dynamics of the people in our house uh, and the situation in the world outside. And it was simple, it was easy, and if it was familiar to, both, uh, to me, both in subject matter and to others in terms of a communal at-home experience, since that's what most of us were going through. And hey, there were willing subjects around the house every day. The process of making straight documentary images like these while trying to be inventive and avoid repetition helped me understand the benefits of working repetitively and familiarly instead of feeling defeated by the state of the world or more appropriately alongside feeling defeated by the state of the world. Uh, I was more productive than I had been in a long time taking advantage of the situation while making personal work that represented actual physical time spent together with my family. Scientists believe that uh, there's a part of the brain, they don't believe there's a part of the brain, scientists believe that a part of the brain called the striatum helps us process, measure, and understand time. How do I know this? Breaking my ribs and sitting around on a computer. Taking time off of teaching allowed me to restructure my routine and I developed a new appreciation for and a sense of how time was passing. Time speeds up as we age relative to our internal clocks, which the striatum helps regulate. Researchers like Peter Mangan and Steven Taylor posit that part of this is due to how our lives become more repetitive as we age and we encounter fewer and fewer new experiences. A lack of new experiences, sorry, this is gonna be kind of depressing <laughs> for the students, but whatever, you'll grow up eventually and maybe you'll make different kinds of lives than we have. Uh, uh, where was I, I'm sorry. Um, uh, these, they posit that uh, time, that 
they posit that part of this is due to how our lives become more repetitive as we age and we encounter fewer and fewer new experiences. A lack of new experiences requires less processing in the brain, which they say results in less dopamine production, and that lack of excitement in our brains translates to us experiencing time more quickly as it passes. It's as if the brain recalibrates its striatum on account of how many repetitive elements there are within our lives. Uh, and Mangan um, did work where he studied different groups of people of different ages, uh, a group of teenagers and, and people in their early 20s, and a group of older folks who were in their 50s and 60s, and had them, it was very simple and kind of genius in how he put it together, he had them estimate how long it took to get to three minutes uh, by just counting one 1,000, two 1,000 until they hit 180 seconds to get to three minutes. And the younger group averaged uh, three minutes and three seconds for their estimate, and the older group averaged three minutes and 40 seconds, so a whole half a minute uh, longer than uh, younger folks. My break from teaching allowed me to uh, dive into rabbit holes about topics I knew little about, and it helped me restructure my approach to image making and the theoretical concepts that surround my work. Time emerged as one concept I was most fascinated with, from learning about aging and how we, how we process time in our brains, to learning a bit about entropy and the inevitability of the arrow of time, and, and uh, uh, the byproduct of that is arguing with Professor Amy Yielding upstairs about whether time is a human-made construct or if it's an actual, uh, actual thing, uh, to the notion of deep time and the imposingly named clock of the long now. The prototype uh, seen here for the clock of the long now uh, is meant to measure uh, the time between now, or when the actual clock is finally built, and 10,000 years into the future. It is, it's like conceptual art meets engineering meets anthropology meets science, um, and it's a really fascinating uh, topic. Another topic that deserves uh, a deep dive in a completely different talk than this as well is the concept of nuclear semiotics, which addresses the challenge presented to scientists and sort of by proxy politicians regarding how to alert future humans to the dangers of nuclear waste tens of thousands of years from now when we are all long gone, spoiler alert, but our spent nuclear fuel remains buried in empty or, by that time in the future, densely populated deserts in New Mexico and Nevada. Both of these concepts address our mortality in the present day and operate on the assumption that there will be humans in the distant future. On April 16th, 2020, I took a picture looking out the back window of the kitchen in uh, the house where we used to live. This was a month into quarantine, uh, so I hope that uh, you all forgive me for not remembering why I took that picture in the first place. Kind of had mushy COVID brain. Uh, uh, on April 21st, I took another. In May, I took 21 shots from the same location, and by the end of 2020, I had a collection of over 120 images. As the year rolled into the next, uh, I kept taking semi-regular photographs from the exact same spot every day, uh, mostly at the same time. They're all mostly taken from the morning, uh, with the exception of one specific one that I remember from nighttime and threw it in because of the contrast. It's not special, it's just, it's just different looking. Uh, call it grounding or whatever else you want to label it, but it comforted me in a way that I wouldn't come to fully realize until all 378 of those images taken between April 2020 and July of 2022, uh, when we moved out of that house, were assembled on the wall. And the last dated photo, that's July, I can't remember, 6th or something, is, is um, the exact last day when we left the house uh, for good and locked it up and gave the keys to somebody else. Repetition and routine became a grounding focus of my sabbatical year, both before and after my injury. My regularly scheduled art time grew into a more and more cherished moment of uh, my days, each day almost a copy of the previous. Art critic Rosalind Krauss, when discussing the meaning inherent in photographic processes, remarked on the total collapse of difference when photographs are copied over and over again. She was expanding the theoretical basis of uh, Walter Benjamin's writing on mechanical, that is to say photographic, reproduction uh, from several decades before, but her ideas about copying and repetition also apply to the photographic grid, uh, disintegrating the difference between the original and the copy. And in this piece, all I can do 
This assemblage of incessantly repetitive photos marks the passage of time like that of a visual calendar, each day only slightly different from the last, to the point that even in the face of apparent differences, snow versus rain, sunshine versus clouds, uh, sunshine or glare versus non-glare, uh, <clears throat> all the photos, though, look the same. There is a first image in the sequence as well as a final image, but there is no original image. All I can do represents the part of my sabbatical where I used my newfound available time to circle back to projects and images from years before. In fact, many of the images in this exhibition weren't necessarily taken during my sabbatical, but they were processed and created during that time. But it wasn't all time spent just sitting around looking at old work, though after I got hurt there was a lot of that. My routine included side projects uh, where I was noticing patterns in the world that I thought deserved capturing in photographic form. Not because of uh, visual appeal, per se, uh, but simply because they were repetitive occurrences. Two of these side projects focused on plain old cloud formations and trespassers on the grand staircase. As I approached this exhibition, I knew that some of these projects, representing not only quantity but also the passage of time, needed to be featured to link dis disparate images and reinforce these ideas of time that I was exploring. And based on, based on my, I guess, now natural process, you might get to see these images actually printed out and exhibited maybe in like four or five years. Uh, both uh, park circles over on that wall, oh, I have a slide, there we go, and uh, all I can do behind me relied on a specific routine in their creation. These images here document a changing embossment in the grass over at Candy Cane Park uh, from mid-February to mid-March in 2023. I made the first impressions out of boredom uh, while throwing the ball for the dog every weekday around lunchtime. He shows up several times, and I should have thanked him in the beginning, uh, but I didn't. Uh, sorry, Ziggy. Um, he's probably really sad right now because I'm not home. After a few days, uh, widening the circle a couple of times until it was about maybe six feet across, uh, and uh, it snowed. And the first time it was covered in snow, which is like the third image in that pair of the top uh, sequence over there, I liked that a little bit, uh, and it kind of struck me as I was maybe onto something. So I was interacting with the space a bit more, and it became a series in my mind uh, on March 10th. When approaching the park, I could see the circle snow-covered indentation from across the street. I even remember telling or, telling or asking, either is absurd, the dog that, that you could see it. From, I, was, I was just like, Ziggy, you can see the circle. And he did not. He didn't care. Uh, uh, it was mark making combined with photography in a way that I had never experimented with uh, before, vaguely, vaguely calling to mind uh, works by Robert Smithson or Christo and Jean-Claude, who I realized are like maybe the only artists who make earthworks, and that's like the end of my list of knowledge of those artists, uh, uh, which is why that's not exclusively what I do. Uh, the, repetitive day, the repetitive way that I work also uh, reminds me of, Noah Kal of the work of Noah Kalina, whose original video work every day, is anybody familiar with this? People have seen this? Um, uh, was uploaded to YouTube back in 2006. YouTube was like just a new invention uh, when he put it up. It was a composite video of self-portraits that he took nearly every day for six years, from 2000 to 2006. Uh, today, the project continues over 8,700 frames later into its third decade. This level of personal commitment is part of what makes a series like Every Day so powerful uh, makes, and also makes me feel insecure about my working method. It's like, well, why didn't you take a picture every day? Well, I didn't, uh, but he did. Uh, it also makes it um, so powerful in its initial popularity, broadcasting on the internet during YouTube's nascent days, uh, making it a groundbreaking work from the beginning of the digital age, basically. And here he is. More, much more recently. Its impersonal and sterile depiction of its subject, however, leaves some things to be desired in terms of how it relates to photography, both aesthetically and maybe a little bit conceptually. Uh, but it's a testament to time in terms of aging and brings me back to my portraiture. Pictures of people, I take pictures of people. There is evidence of time passing in the windows and the park circles featured here, but what about the portraits? Step over. 
oh, that projector fan is warming my water. Didn't anticipate that. I'm worrying about earthquakes, and I should have just looked right in front of me. I've been shooting large format portraits since 2016, and have made it a point to haul my camera with me to fish concerts and cricket matches in order to capture the people that I meet. All the photos serve as evidence of what Roland Barthes refers to, referred to as the, quote, that has been, a summation of photo photography's depiction of the past. There's also a connection to mortality in that, but we'll get to that um, a little bit later. In that sense, all photographs reveal the passage of time, and as a result, age and aging. As I've returned to, the event, to events like fish shows, I've encountered and photographed the same subjects multiple times. Um, and I'm drawn to the familiarity that emerges both because of the uh, familiarity between myself and subjects, uh, such as Megan, who uh, I met the first year uh, I started shooting portraits, um, and I photographed three times, along with her husband, Alex, who is uh, the guy who I don't have. I said I wasn't going to point, and I said I had slides, but I don't. He's got the baseball cap on in the corner over there, which you can all turn and look at after I'm done. Uh, the, um, and, uh, but these also reference the familial nature of the crowds at concerts. Every time we go to the gorge and Fish is playing, it's this family reunion, and you run into the same people. Uh, in 2018, they, they specifically looked for me and my camera so that they could get their pictures taken again, and it just like warmed my heart so much. Uh -huh. uh, Nicholas Nixon's portraits of his wife and her three sisters, uh, begun in 1975, address similar issues of repetition, the family, and passage of time. When writing about the 40th anniversary of, this is not the 40th anniversary, that would have been 2015. Uh, but when writing about the 40th anniversary of the first uh, photos in this series, author Susan Minot remarked, as we come to the last pictures, we feel the final inevitability that, as Nixon says, everyone won't be here forever. Depending on the context and the situation, I find it difficult to communicate serious emotions. One byproduct of that is to quote others, like Nicholas Nixon or Susan Minow, who can sum up things uh, much better than I can. Another way is to stand behind a camera and to use the machine to create emotional distance between you, between me, and a subject. Emotion was easy to spot over the course of a month-long artist residency I was part of in Buenos Aires, Argentina, uh, back in November of 2022. I landed in, in Argentina uh, th to, uh, the day before the Men's World Cup started, and my residency finished three days before the title game in December, uh, images of which are seen here at the game and afterwards at the celebration, uh, when Argentina defeated France and all hell broke loose in a celebration that packed streets and subway cars with four million people, estimated, celebrating fans uh, filling almost every square foot of the downtown corridor. And I just, oh, I forgot. I was going to add a note. Uh, I, lo I love her so much. <laughs> I love this picture and her nail polish and her phone has this green case. Um, and, uh, and the print is in my office and it just, it wouldn't fit in the exhibition and it had some print issues. And so anyway, at least we get to see her now. I also spent time at my residency slowing down, getting into a routine and developing a drawing and painting practice that the time there allowed me. Conceptually, I was interested in this idea of translation, um, of photographs that I was taking around Buenos Aires and then turning them into paintings and drawings, uh, similar to how I was constantly looking up words and phrases in order to get across my ideas, or more accurately, my simple questions uh, that I was trying to phrase in Spanish. These quiet still lifes, uh, I guess, uh, leaf blower, is it still life? Um, resonate in stark contrast to the emotional scenes of the World Cup matches. Uh, the line work here and, uh, and I'm sorry, the line work and paint uh, kept loose. The lightweight emotions of silence here contrasting the heft and mass of black and white relief, frustration, and ecstasy. These images are maybe the purest con uh, documentary images that I've ever shot, uh, relying on chance and circumstance in the fashion of true photo uh, journalism. With these images of strangers, action and movement are frozen completely still. It's not a pose uh, like the portraits where the stillness comes from the subjects themselves, but freezing action or 
freezing action is a technique that I teach students early on, beginning photography classes, uh, yet it's so effective when it comes to documents of such frenzied scenes. It's important to note that these images emerge from folders of thousands of shots, uh, and for me, there's a quality entwined with the images that anonymizes them in terms of how I captured them, where the images represent my memories, my time spent in Argentina, absorbing the culture and food and music and sport, uh, but something in them still, even, a, gosh, a year and a half, a year and a half later? Yeah, uh, makes me feel like I didn't take them. Um, there's this sort of like emotional separation for some reason because, because of their photojournalistic nature that they're, that they're being presented to me instead of I made them to present to someone else, whereas the portraits don't do that. Uh, and I don't have that in my notes because I still don't totally understand that concept or why that's happening uh, in my brain. Uh, walking to the main park, though, in central Buenos Aires to watch these matches on a 40-foot tall screen was an event, uh, and I was a participant in the whole thing. And I think that that inclusiveness of being part of those events makes me feel more separated from the images um, uh, that, that go along with, with this one and the others, even if I had the camera and I was attempting to document the spectacle as an outsider. Those images, these images, those, uh, rely on spontaneity and the luck of the draw. Uh, there was an emotional component to the compulsory images from COVID times, where the photos depicted a slice of time spent with my family, uh, intimate images representing a very distinct moment in time for many, many people. These images were a glimpse into our personal lives, and this one, uh, arguably the most personal, is featured here. What didn't become clear until the installation of the show, however, was the connection between works such as All I Can Do, the windows behind me, and the personal narrative of this post-surgery image, or really any photograph that I took between early 2020 and mid-2022. Hidden between these two windows, December 12th, 2020, and December 21st, 2020, uh, is, uh, which comes sequentially in the grid up here on the wall, is our son's trip to Boise with my wife, the surgery itself, his recovery period, and his return home. These two windows bookend all of those events, and the fact that no window pictures uh, exist from those actual days also speaks volumes. No matter the date, there is an approximate record of any day somewhere in this grid of windows apparent and hidden at the same, apparent and hidden at the same time. Uh, the grid is littered with significant dates uh, to both me and my family, as well as viewers uh, or friends at home or uh, anybody if they're inclined to think of their lives or memories in the same way. As a result, this catalog of physical time becomes enriched with emotional time within its labels and, oops, repetitive signifiers, and also, maybe on the live stream, I'd like to use this opportunity to wish my uh, wife a very happy belated anniversary. <laughs> and that's in here, and that's in here somewhere. So, how do we, oh, perfect. Here we are, all, still, we're all still here, all still with me. Uh, so what might all of it mean? Well. Within my work, there are implied relationships between the subject sitting for a portrait and me as the photographer, each portrait a record of our time spent together, just one-on-one. -on -one. The fact that many of these subjects are strangers, excuse me, accentuates the emotional distance contained within the portraits, their neutral appearances contrasting with the hectic, crowded environments in which they were taken. Uh, and these, these uh, portraits from the Major League Cricket Championship uh, from earlier, or from last summer, um, are taken from the concourse where this, this, where both of these other images were taken. You can actually see the reflection of the concourse in uh, Lada's glasses uh, behind me. Now I just ad-libbed, and now I confused myself as to where I was. An actual cricket championship uh, is the exact opposite of the content of of the portraits, more like a World Cup viewing party than a quiet private photo session. With these images, my aim is to elevate the subjects through intimacy, physical closeness, sheer size, and all the underpinnings of traditional straight portraiture to an iconic status on par with the events that are happening around them. Subjects are often uh, 
taken aback both at being asked to be photographed, like, why me when all of this excitement surrounds us? Because they're there to see fish. They're there to see cricket. And it's strange on the surface, it's strange on the surface for me to uh, want to see them, right? Uh, and in the resulting images, especially at these larger sizes, any gathering, even the one in which we're now all participating, depends on the people existing in that space to justify it, right? Fish can't play to an empty house, uh, although they did in December 2021, because as a byproduct of the, uh, uh, it was one of the new strains of COVID, and so like things kind of shut down again. So they just played this concert to nobody, and it streamed online, and people stayed at home and watched it. Uh, and cricket, or any sport, uh, doesn't pack the same punch or intensity uh, when the stands are vacant, which the NBA and Major League Baseball and maybe National Hockey League, were there football games during COVID? Empty? I don't know. Basketball was empty because they did their whole thing in the bubble, right, down in Florida. Uh, as with all photographs, there's an implied importance of the subject, a vital element to any picture, but also an indication of a photographer's acknowledgement of that importance. And that importance grows, uh, sorry, the importance of the figures grow with each passing year, with each summer concert tour or every annual tournament. With new presentation or interaction with these images, the subjects and memories become more ingrained in my mind, and I start to develop a relationship with the subjects outside of the events themselves. I get to know the folks over and over again, whether I'm sorting and organizing my negatives uh, with newfound available time during a sabbatical, uh, which I only kind of got halfway through, and when I was going back through for some of this, like, I thought I organized them all. They're still, they're in binders now, but it's, like, not archived the way it should be. Uh, or when they reemerge in a gallery exhibition. That connection, that evidence of our time spent together, is now at the forefront of the work I'm trying to make. In spite of the presentation, the formality, the stoicism, the connection with my subjects is paramount. I managed with still healing ribs to make it to Seattle uh, last spring uh, for Fish's tour opening shows at Climate Pledge Arena. Um, it's a very cool venue if you've never been there for any kind of thing. Uh, I highly recommend it if you can make it uh, and see something. Uh, per usual, I dragged photo equipment with me uh, in spite of how I was feeling uh, up and down the hills, which in retrospect was like, what a stupid idea, but I did it anyway. Uh, this time around though, I focused on landscape. Uh, I kind of, I tried, I tried to think of something more eloquent than I wasn't in the mood to take pictures of people, but I wasn't in the mood to take pictures of people, uh, so I didn't. My good friend Jason uh, was supposed to go with me, uh, but the day of fell ill at the last minute, as many of you know. And what started for him as an apparent run-of-the-mill illness quickly escalated into a life-changing emergency that had a rippling effect across our EOU community. The personal stake I have in the lives of my subjects is magnified by the pres their presence of, the, or sorry, magnified by the presence of their, of, oh my goodness. The personal stake I have in the lives of my subjects is magnified by the presence of the images themselves. And Jason's medical emergency compounded my own feelings of mortality as I continued to recover from the most serious injury of my life. Since graduate school, and especially since I turned to portraiture, eight years ago or so, I have uh, focused, maybe some would say obsessed, with Roland Barthes' writing on photography and the medium's focus of death, of time in the past, and of documenting the that has been. Much of Barthes' Camera Lucida, uh, which is kind of a, this seminal text that most photo students in grad school will read, uh, revolves around his emotional connection to a photograph of his mother, which is never printed in the text. He simply just doesn't show us the image. And it doesn't even like reinforce his concept by not showing it. It's just, it's just not there. Uh, until recently, those notions of death were more, uh, were very abstract, flung far into the future of every photo that I made. Theoretical ideas that my chosen medium has sort of picked up along its journey since its invention nearly 200 uh, years ago. That anniversary is coming up. It's like two years from now to celebrate 200 years of photography. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, and sure, I know mortality is real and that so many images from the past are now just records of things that have long since passed and only exist as printed memories. And I know and knew 
that interacting with people using the camera invited a sense of togetherness among fellow fish fans or cricket fans, allowing me to ingratiate myself into select subcultures in spite of any of my social anxieties. These guys were great, and I don't have pictures of them. I'm still like on a quest. Where's Michael Dakota? You asked me who I need to take pictures of? I need those guys. Because they were really fun. And I don't, and they, but they never, I said, come find me. They didn't come find me. Uh, my sabbatical, going backwards, official, no, it's the algorithm. My official, my sabbatical officially began when I took a road trip down to New Mexico for an antique tintype workshop in Santa Fe. And Santa Fe was awesome. I really liked it. I traveled alone and made pictures along the way. Uh, and I took like four different cameras with me, all kinds of film and digital uh, as well. My first uh, important stop was Arches National Park outside of Moab, Utah. It was literally a monumental place. I should have taken that out. That's stupid. Um, and everything, I thought, I mean, you got to laugh, but. Um, and everything felt electric as I set up to capture an image of one of the tower, numerous towering rock formations, like driving along the path and parking in one of the pullout sort of sections. However, like Roland Barthes, who would think that it was uh, ironic, I simply can't show you that specific photo because on my first attempt at focusing the camera, it broke. The bellows, actually the first thing that happened was I discovered that I didn't have the right thread size to attach the camera to my tripod. Uh, so I set it on top of a, ca I know, I know, I know. You would think that <laughs> the person leaving and driving three and a half thousand miles or whatever would, would remember to check that, but he didn't. Um, and uh, so I set it on top of the camera case itself. And that would have worked if the glue hadn't given way uh, and it, the bellows, the accordion thing, it's the old fashioned camera you put, you look underneath a blanket to sort of look through. Uh, and it, the accordion came detached from the front part of the camera. Uh, what made that moment significant, uh, except apart from it being a hilarious anecdote, uh, and helps me connect my point, uh, maybe, full circle about time, about Roland Barthes, about mortality, or about photography, is that it was my first attempted shot with a camera I acquired from a woman I barely knew named Kip, the widow of our former colleague Richard Croft. In my sabbatical proposal in November of 2021, I referenced this specific camera, writing, I do not have any idea what to create with this new camera. This, our dean read this. I wrote this to the dean. I do not have any idea what to create with this new camera, and it energizes me to have time to wander and explore, to get into trouble or new situations, and honor our former colleague through the use of an instrument he held dear. Then, on January 23rd, I took a detour, like this just past January 23rd, so what is that, like 19, 11 days ago, whatever? No, it doesn't matter. Uh, I took it, no, it does matter. Eight, 19 days ago, yeah. Uh, I took a detour on a run near campus, the backside of campus here, uh, just to tack on an extra quarter mile or a half a mile or whatever, like I was too close to home and I needed to hit a certain distance or whatever. And as I looped around the cemetery uh, near where it abuts the field house on the backside of campus, I happened completely at random to glance over and I saw this memorial on the left. Billy Loonis was a media arts student several years ago. Maybe, I don't have, I no longer have emails from Billy because of the email retention policy or the switch from what we used to have to Google. So that places it back in 2015 or something like that. Anyway, uh, and while he moved in and out of my classes, uh, he kind of floated through the, the um, art, media arts departments um, over a few years. Just seeing that he had passed, which was something that I had not heard about, um, struck me to my core. Uh, and I knew that, that I had to, I just had, I had to mention it in, in this talk because of the context of everything else. It reminded me of what uh, my photographs represent. It reminded me of Richard uh, and his camera and of Kimmy Moore, an EOU alum and another former student of mine uh, who I remembered had passed away at about the same time in 2020. And, not planned, uh, it turns out that the day that I ran into Billy's marker in the cemetery, January 23rd, would have been Kimmy's 34th birthday. To the day, which, I don't know. That's something, right? And now, all of these photographs, these repetitive things that just accumulate for me, 
piling up because of my job or my compulsion or my desire to slow down time or remember things better or to get to know people better. These photographs have brought us all together for this amount of time, these 39 minutes. Wow, 39 minutes. Uh, these pictures are the reason you all wandered in here today, and they're the reason why I'm standing up here talking to you in the first place. But they are all inclusive, <clears throat> excuse me, representative of a sliver of my time on Earth, of the time I've spent staring out the window, watching seasons change, seeing shows, walking the dog, <laughs> or meeting people I otherwise never would have talked to. My sabbatical taught me that it's a true, privilege, a true privilege to do what I do, to do what we do, and to have the opportunities to make pictures, create bonds, or have arguments, or nerd out about equipment, or cameras, or printers, or, let's admit it, fish. <laughs> and spending time away from teaching, from interacting with the students that I have the privilege to know and work with, helped me realize that even in the face of imminent mortality, uh, hopefully not as imminent as, <laughs> hopefully more, less imminent rather than more imminent, uh, there are things and music and people and sports to love. And capturing them in photos might be one of the most meaningful things that I do. So, as I wrap up, let's chat, because if you've got the time, I've got the inclination. I hope to see you out on the pitch or on summer tour. Thank you. Terms and conditions aside, does anybody have any It was questions? a joke. I was going <laughs> to, I wanted, I couldn't find a good meme that just said, it's a joke. Yeah. The best one I could find was the Simpsons one where it's like Radioactive Man and he says, that's the joke, but that didn't make sense. So it was a joke. We can do questions. I love taking questions. Are there any questions? <clears throat> Corey. Oh, <laughs> That's a Doug Kegler joke. Yeah. Is this working? Um, I know you're a aficionado, um, <laughs> but I didn't know you're into cricket. What is that about? Oh, it's uh, cricket. Cr my my fandom for cricket emerged. It it has to have been through. COVID or whatever, we, we, it has, it, it must have been during COVID, we splurged and subscribed to the streaming package to get Disney Plus for the kid and to get ESPN Plus. And almost every night, because of the time difference for the countries where cricket is popular, like nine o'clock when you're vegging out before you go to bed, there's almost always cricket on ESPN Plus. And it always, I knew about it and it fascinated me and I played baseball and I knew there were some similarities and uh, but lots of differences. And it just, it's just, it, part of it truthfully, this is, what, this is what my wife says and I kind of agree, is that it's like, it's like a, it's a niche enough interest like fish that I can be into it and that annoys people. And so I like, <laughs> and so I like that. Um, because no, it's mine, and nobody else likes it, even though that's not true. You like cricket? Yeah. I've talked to Steve about Yeah, I've talked to Steve about <laughs> cricket in India a little bit, yeah. And, um, and as soon as I got wind of the MLC is Major League Cricket, um, last year was its inaugural year, and all the matches took place at this one stadium in Texas, and, and, uh, and another weekend, I think, in North Carolina, but the, there's, there are pockets in Texas of, um, of south, mostly Southeast Asian uh, migrants who settled in like Houston and Dallas for, I don't know, because if you're coming to America and you want America, like what's more American than Texas, I guess. And they are, and, and like, and, and now that a few generations of, of uh, folks who are cricket fans because of where they grew up or where their parents grew up, they are converting public park spaces and things to have cricket grounds and there's like intramurals and youth leagues. And so they targeted that area of the country to host these matches. And 
when I found out it was going to be a thing, I contacted the, um, the league and their media representative, and I said, can I come down and take pictures? And they said, sure, we'll have, we'll have, we have a crew who documents in India and, and in South Africa who do these images professionally, and I had to be like, oh, I don't want to take pictures of people playing cricket. I want to take pictures of people who are at cricket. And they went, okay. And that's how I got the trophy and the drummer guy and the, and the, and the other portraits too, yeah. But yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> other yeah. questions? There's one here in the middle. No, you'll be on the thing. Um, yeah, how do you select people? Like when you're, is there something that draws you or what is the process when you find the person who you want to take a picture of? Uh, I've, uh, so between, between the several times that I've photographed at, at Fish, only once was I by myself. Uh, I think that was 2016. And the camera just attracts people. Um, it's an old, uh, uh, Richard's camera is um, is uh, like a more modern, contemporary, all black kind of thing. So it 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 looks like a big video camera box kind of thing. Um, but the camera that I normally use is this. It's wooden framed, and the accordion bellows part is red. Uh, and and the way that I would set up these images is drive into the parking lot, put the hatch up on the back of our uh, car, hang a white sheet drag the cooler out of the, I guess drag the cooler out first, then hang the sheet, and people sat on the cooler and the tripod was in between the lanes of all the parked cars. And because, because you have hours of time, um, it's essentially tailgating at, 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 at venues like the Gorge especially, um, people are just wandering around to go buy t-shirts or get grilled cheese sandwiches or, or chat or, or look for people who are familiar um, I don't have a specific tactic for like zeroing in on people. Um, I feel I feel like that become I I just can't get around it not feeling predatory, um, and uh, in the gentlest form of that word I guess. Um, and uh, and so I kind of like try to create an inviting atmosphere so that people will chat. Because you talk to everybody. I mean, every even if they don't look at the what's this, like they notice it later. Um, but everyone is everyone is friendly. And and cricket was, cricket was very different because I was in the middle. I mean, I was definitely an other uh, at the cricket match because there was a, just a sliver of the fans who were there who looked anything like me at all. And so it was really, um, it was a real different way to. Uh, I had to. I had to. I didn't do anything different, but it was just this. It was just this different atmosphere in terms of how do how do I um, how do I even talk about what I'm doing? Because now at fish shows, people will like I know people because of how many. I mean, it's I've at least 200 different people over the course of I don't know seven years or eight years or whatever, uh, and. Uh, I would I would always the bottom line is I would always rather a willing subject than try to sell the idea to somebody who clearly isn't gonna buy into it because it makes for a, a much easier um, interaction with people yeah does that answer your question okay good <laughs> other questions yeah you better think of something <laughs> um, so I was trying to think of a way to extrapolate this into a sexy question, but I don't think I've succeeded. Y one of your first slides was of an image, the first and only image we have of a black hole. Oh, yeah. yeah Can you talk right a little bit, just as a place, it's like the only place where time breaks down in a way that... Sort of. Uh, I didn't, um, I mean, luckily, man, I was adding stuff as of, I mean, that's why I was walking up the hill with you, Corey. Like, I was adding to the slides minutes before I left the house. Um, and... Uh, the man space is space is so cool <laughs> um the uh it um and it kind of it it i i tried i didn't want to really dive into it because i didn't want to cheapen the seriousness of it that like if i don't know i wouldn't i wouldn't want to go to a talk about uh entropy and then have the person talking go way into detail about 
cameras and photography to be like, you, dude, you don't know what you're talking about. Or lady, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and, uh, but um, as it connects to this work, and I mean, I, I, I'm really fascinated by this idea of entropy, which is the, I'm gonna get it wrong, which is the, the tendency of things to, oh gosh, I don't have my notes. Enter, like some, I'll, let me let me let me back up. Some scientists say that entropy is what gives us time, like it's why we have time, and it's what creates the arrow of time that moves us forward. We can always go. We are always going to the future, which is entropy, um, and it's a it's a. It's the, it's the progression from an ordered state to a disordered state. Um, and the, the, so the least amount of entropy ever, literally ever, is the moment of the Big Bang, because that's the most ordered, and then it's been chaos ever since. Um, and except when like certain things are, it's not anti-time or anti-entropy, it's like planets forming, like that's the coalescence of material is like giving a sense of order, but then all those now celestial objects have to interact and find their path or whatever. And we just weren't, we as people, we just weren't around for any of that. And so everything is like, it's great to live here. And it's great to live here because if it wasn't great to live here, we wouldn't live here. Um, there wouldn't be people, there wouldn't be life. Um, and so there's this interconnectedness between the ideas of entropy and how it might create time. And, and I, I didn't get into it because I, I kind of haven't, fully formed the ideas, but I think to some extent the fact that photographs can, my photographs are only, I won't say they, what they can do, they are only depicting the past, that they are this pull, they are this attempt to pull us back from the continuation towards chaos. And, and it is, it's, that's an idea that I, did, I wouldn't have expressed that way, but when I was an undergrad, all of my critiques were about, Mike, you're just trying to control things. You're just trying to be in control. Like you're trying to, it's just, it's all, everything is ordered and symmetrical and, 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 and still and, and, and now I've kind of through sabbatical and digging into YouTube videos and research papers and books and things, it's, I kind of think that that is a, an even bigger kind of conceptual idea uh, and the, the real reason was I, was that the black hole, the picture of the black hole semi relates to that because of these ideas of like, well, we don't know what happens and time doesn't, like we saw Interstellar, but that's not a documentary. Uh, <laughs> and, but in, in reality, the, the circular picture of the black hole mirrors the campground at the gorge. So it was a circle, it was a circle to begin the slides and it's a circle to end the slides. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I picked it. Another question over here. The black hole picture? It had words over it, so that's why. I could have just, yeah. Oh, there, there it is. That's what that is. Yeah, the first one ever, taken by a woman. Or she led the team that helped develop it or something, yeah. This is not my work, no. The picture of the Gorge Campground is not my work either. <clears throat> I didn't, I don't have a drone, yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the itch, I don't need to. That doesn't count as your question, Susan. <laughs> We've got a question over here. Um, I have a question when it comes to your repeat subjects, uh -huh. especially. So these people who do seek you out for yet again another portrait, uh -huh. What are those conversations like? Like, are they interested in what your project actually is? How does that shape the project? And that can also tie into the idea of control that you were called out in undergrad, right? Doing yeah. portraiture, how does that relate to control for you when it comes to photographing these subjects? And how do those conversations go if you can remember them at all? Wow. Um, it's, there are different degrees of like willingness for, peop for some people to be photographed again. Uh, if I get the sense that they're not, they're not going to go along with it, then I won't 
push it, even though now that, that especially for fish as it's been going on for a while, that is something that I, would, I really would love to reconnect with people, um, especially after longer uh, spans of time. Um, I mean, if there, are, if there are shows this summer and, and it's someone who I haven't seen since 2016, um, a lot can happen in eight years. Uh, the, um, the, uh, I was thinking about shows this summer, so I got distracted. Um, but yeah, the, the, it's, it's almost, it's, I, it's not the, I guess, well, making, making the photo is part of the process. And, and I'm in control, and I want to be in control for part of the process, but the images themselves started as these blank slate kind of expressions because, because one of the first people whose picture I took probably asked me what they were supposed to do, and I knew that I didn't want people to smile because that, that introduction of like artifice um, or, or what they think they should do, um, I didn't want that to get in the way of like who they might actually be if the camera was, and I if the camera could actually depict that. And I wasn't, I wasn't after that when it first started. I just thought, hey, this is, might be a fun way to pass the time while we're sitting here and to meet people. Um, but the, uh, so I don't, I don't force a lot of movement or pose or anything in anybody. Unless the, the way the camera works is um, it's a slow process to get started. So people sit down and I have to focus the camera. And to do that, I disappear and I'm moving the camera parts forward and back. And I'll pick up the tripod and move closer or farther away. And there's this, um, it's not even a level of discomfort. I mean, it might be for some people, but it, they, they fidget and they, and they move and they will. So occasionally, the, uh, uh, as I'm focusing, I will see them, uh, they'll turn and, and oh, I like their profile and I haven't, um, and I haven't like really focused on a profile image in a while. And so I'll, I'll ask them to do that again. But it's, when I'm asking them to do something specific, it's, it's, it's almost always something that I've just seen them do. They'll, they'll adjust their glasses or they'll tuck their hair behind their ear or they'll pull on their collar or they'll run their hands through their hair. Um, or like one guy, he'll hold up his, there was a guy who was walking around. He, he referred to himself as, it would be such a distraction to include the photo. He, refer, he was referring to himself as general disarray <laughs> of the fish army. And he was walking around with aviator sunglasses and he was handing out $2 bills to people. So he had this stack, he had this wad of $2 bills and he was, and I was like, this guy is not gonna say no to a picture. Um, <laughs> and, and I took his picture, and he and he just said, "Like, can I fl can I flash my two dollar bills? Who's on the two dollar bill? Thomas Jefferson? Is that it? I, so?" He probably said, "Can I flash my Jeffersons?" And I was just like, "Sure, dude, Fla flash away." Um, <laughs> and uh, it helps. I find that it helps people be comfortable. So it's um, if they're doing something that they just that they just did. Like if their head is tilted, and then. Then I pop back up, I'm done focusing, and they will sometimes freeze back up, and I don't want that, and they don't want that. Um, and, so, and so to have them relax, I'll mention, oh, you turned your head, or look over at that guy, and because they're in groups and things too, and they'll talk to each other, and I let that play out so that I'm not the boss of that, because that's not who they are. Um, the, uh, this is a really long answer. You, um, you asked about the repeat um, uh, subjects, the, the first people were those two, Alex and Megan, um, and they, they camped next to me in 2016. And so when they pulled up in the parking lot, I recognized them. They recognized me. We chatted, got pictures. Two years later, they <clears throat> I was in almost the exact same spot in the parking lot because my routine was the same, of course, like when the gates open and finding a spot, et cetera, and setting up. And they did almost the exact same thing and came, like they came down the row and saw my camera and ran up and had, they had used their 2016 portraits as their wedding invitation portraits. Uh, and they had them printed and displayed at their opening reception, like where people sign the guest book. And I was just flattered in this way of like, 
<laughs> well, I mean, on the one hand, like, that is what I've become, a wedding photographer, I guess. <laughs> uh, but the, um, but the, the connection that the people have to their photos later on and, the, and just the, we talked about this in, um, in junior theory just the other day, is like that response is, is I value that as much or more than the response from viewers who don't have connections to the images, even though that's all, that's, I mean, that's really important um, and super interesting, but it's a, um, but it's a matter of like, uh, it's a matter of not, um, really not forcing anything. Just let it happen, man. Just like the show. <laughs> or cricket, it'll, it'll just, I don't know, that ball went sideways, I guess, sometimes. Yeah. All right, well, I think that's all the time we have, but uh, sure. thank you very, very much. Thank you, thanks everybody.